Good morning. morning. What a lovely looking group you are. Thank you for having us this weekend. It's just been a delight to be here. Bob and Jane have been such gracious hosts to us, and we're very, very grateful to them. Amy Reed, she's a keeper. Uh, (laughs) She has worked behind the scenes so diligently and made things for us so easy, so uh, please thank her on our behalf. We have done so as well, but what a, what a, a delightful person she is. Betsy Caldwell, are you here somewhere today? So you're calling out somebody that's not here. What a horrible thing. <laughs> but uh, Betsy helped make it possible for us to be here, and we're very, very grateful to her. I saw our friend Marianne Poole earlier, so I know you're here someplace. Oh gosh, you're, you're in a Methodist seat all the way to the back. Well, it's Marianne's a friend of Paige and mine for a number, number of years. And what a, what a blessing to see you. The music, just outstanding. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I don't usually like to take uh, a lot of credit that's not mine, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to just say this. It may sound vain. I don't mean it that way, but you are really lucky to have me here uh, <laughs> because otherwise, what a boring weekend you would have suffered through. <laughs> Good Lord, you folks are on uppers or something. What is, are you always this busy? <laughs> We thought, we'll come down here and rest. I'm going to need a transfusion just to get... (laughs) What a great experience. What a fun weekend. I can't tell you how much we've enjoyed being here and uh, and, and all the festivities that's gone with us. So thank you. Thank you for making that possible for us. We have loved it. Uh, My friend Tom Toole will be here next Sunday morning. You know Tom So you know you're going to have a great Easter Sunday sermon. He is simply outstanding. So it's kind of good news, bad news. Uh, Good news is you get Tom Toole back next Sunday. He's been here before. Bad news is I know that you're having another preacher back for another occasion, which means if I don't get invited again, you will hurt my feelings. (laughs) Tough enough. (laughs) Uh, It's okay, my... My wife told me when we were getting dressed, she said, have a nice flight tomorrow. I'm staying here. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for letting us come. Uh, Bob told me how how much time I have prior to uh, my getting up. (laughs) You know, this is is cosmetic, uh, literally. You remember the story of the, the, the little girl just in her first grade, and it was her first time in big church with her, her parents. Her mother was in the choir, so she's sitting with dad, which means he's the only option she had for asking questions. She had never seen any of it before. And the acolytes came in and lit the candles, and she said, Daddy, what does that mean? He said, it means that the light of the world is now in our midst. Oh, The choir stood up and sang an anthem. Daddy, what does that mean? It means that we are here to praise God, who is our creator. Oh, ushers came down, received the offering. Daddy, what does that mean? It means God has given us everything, and now we get to give something back. Oh, the minister stood up to preach. He took off his watch and laid it on the pulpit. She said, Daddy, what does that mean? He said, that don't mean nothing. (laughs) I will try to look at it. (laughs) Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we thank you for your nearness to us. We thank you for the powerful meaning of this week. And we ask that you will speak to us in this setting, at this moment. Speak to us your word. Don't let me get in the way. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Palm Sunday, what a, what a wonderful festive occasion in most of our churches. When you think about your church back home, for so many years in the churches I served, uh, the same thing would happen. The, the, the middle aisle, at the beginning of the service, I know, Bob, you've been there a hundred times. Uh, well, not a hundred, but a lot of times. Uh, there would be a procession before you sang the first hymn. 
and there'd be a couple of women in the front, Sunday school teachers or moms, and a couple in the back of the line, Sunday school teachers and moms, in between the four, five, and six-year-old children, and they would be wearing their little white robes, you know, and waving their palm branches, and they would be, to the best of their ability, as they came in quoting the poem, Welcome Jesus to our world. Welcome Jesus to our town. Welcome Jesus to our church. We welcome you with palm and gown. And we, you know, preachers and parents and grandparents, smile and applaud. It's great. It is great. And I hope your churches keep doing that. It's such an affirming thing for children. You are aware, of course, that that's not what was going on when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, Hosanna did not mean welcome Jesus to our world, welcome Jesus to our town. Hosanna is a whole different word. Hosanna is a word that was spoken as a plea, to be honest. It was a, a word of urgency bordering on desperation. You know what Hosanna means? It means save us now. Putting it in context. The history of Israel primarily had been the history of suffering. Uh, theirs had been an ongoing story of abuse, attack, enslavement, oppression, occupation. Uh, there had been a few breaks here and there, you know. Uh, most notably, the, the, the rule of David and his son Solomon. Those were the glory years of Israel. That's when they were on top of the world economically, militarily, politically, but it had only lasted a short period of time. And when Jesus rode the donkey into, Palm, in, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it had been 1,100 years since the end of the Davidic and Solomon reign. 1,100 years primarily of suffering. Uh, I want to to put that into context for you uh, when, when we hear together the words. Would you listen with me? Matthew 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples to them saying, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there on which no one has ever ridden, untie it, bring it to me. If anyone asks why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied in a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches or wave them, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now listen to what they said as we conclude our scripture lesson. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the word. This is what scripture says. Not welcome Jesus to our world, welcome Jesus to our town. Save us now. We have lived through 1,100 years since the last good stretch. 1,100 years of suffering and sadness. We remember the stories that our ancestors told about David and Solomon. We remember that, but we've never experienced it ourselves. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. That's what the Palm Sunday lesson is about. Desperate people urgently pleading with one called Messiah. The word Messiah, what does it mean? Deliverer. Pleading with the Deliverer. Save us now. We don't think we can live like this much longer. You know what Palm Sunday feels like, don't you? Some of you. 
Your lives have not been unending pleasure or ease. You've suffered. You read the news. You know what's going on in Ukraine, what's been going on in Syria, what's going on in Yemen. You know what's going on in the lives of some people you love who are bearing unbearable burdens. We know what it's like to say, Hosanna, save us now, deliver us. We don't know if we can take this much anymore. That's the Palm Sunday story biblically. And I think it says three incredibly important things to us. I want to lift them up to you just briefly. (laughs) He says, and that don't mean nothing. uh, I want to lift up these three points to you uh, today as as we try to live into the sacred theme. The first is this. Palm Sunday message says that Jesus knows what you're going through. He didn't ride around Jerusalem. He didn't go on some hill outside the city, look in and say, eh, I think I'm going back to Capernaum. That doesn't look pleasant. He rode into, he was a Jewish rabbi. He understood the history, the pain, the suffering that they had been through. He rode into a city that, that was under Roman occupation. Uh, He rode into a place where people for 1,100 years had been carrying their own kind of cross to face his own kind of cross the next Friday. So whatever you're going through, Jesus knows what it feels like. I went to a doctor uh, some time ago, within the last year, for a consultation about a minor surgical procedure. You know the definition of minor surgery, right? Minor surgery is something done on somebody else. (laughs) So I went to see this guy, supposedly wonderful surgeon, about a minor surgical procedure. uh, And uh, uh, easy outpatient local anesthesia, that sort of thing. And he said to me, I want you to just feel at ease. I do this every day. Simple procedure. I could do it in my sleep. I said, don't. (laughs) Really? I'd rather you didn't. He laughed. He said, "I, I see that you've got a good attitude about this. He said, may I be honest with you? I said, sure. He said, I don't want you to worry about this. I do it all the time. Easy procedure. He said, you know what? Every time I do this surgery, every time, I think to myself, wow, I bet that hurts. I'm glad I don't have to have that done. And I thought, no, this is not what I want to hear. I want to hear somebody say, yeah, I've I've had that very thing. I've been there. I know it can be painful. I'm going to do everything a doctor can do to keep you from hurting. You know what I told him? I said, I'm good. I'm fine. I I will let you know when I think I need this. I'm still fine. I still don't need it. Doing great. When you fall, literally, on your knees and weep out in the agony of prayer, Uh, When you experience what my friend Thomas More described in the title of his book, The Dark Nights of the Soul, you're not praying to someone who says, wow, bet that hurt. Glad I didn't have to go through that. You're praying to a deliverer who knows what you're going through who rode into the pain of Jerusalem, who faced his own cross. And there's some comfort in that, I think. Jesus knows what, I don't know what you're going through, but Jesus does. Uh, If I were to ask for a show of hands, and I'm not going to do that because I hate it. When, (laughs) When I'm in an audience and somebody says, now let's have a show of hands, I always think, That's the most intrusive thing. 
I'm not going to do it to you, but in your imagination, if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning and then pose some questions, how many hands do you think would go up? If I said, for example, have any of you ever been through the almost indescribable pain of divorce? Have any of you ever stood beside the grave of someone who meant more than life to you and your heart broke? Have any of you ever been betrayed by someone you trusted? Have any of you ever been estranged from someone you love? Maybe a child, a parent, a dear friend? Have any of you ever felt guilty? about something you did or said and you would give the world to undo or unsay it, but you can't? If any of you ever struggled with illness? Maybe you now or someone you love now is dealing with Alzheimer's, cancer, some after effect of COVID, heart disease. Any of you ever dealt with depression like three out of every four adults in America today if any of you ever felt lonely as if no one actually fully understands you and maybe they don't really care you know if I were to ask those questions and, re and request a show of hands the question is not how many hands would go up the question is is there a hand in this room that would stay down because we understand Palm Sunday. We understand what it is like to need a deliverer. We understand what it's like to cry out, Hosanna, save us now. I don't know how much more I can take. And when we do that, someone is listening to our prayer who knows what we're going through. Because he entered Jerusalem to face his own cross. There's comfort in that. There's also even greater comfort, I think, in, in my second point, and that's this. Not only does Jesus know what you're going through, Jesus will go through it with you. What was the last thing he said to his disciples before ascending? Now, if, if you were with someone whom you love deeply and dearly, with all your heart, and they were about to move to the other side of the world, and you thought, there's a chance I will never see this person again, you wouldn't waste your conversation on fashion or culinary skills or the weather or athletics. By the way, I went to Duke, so I don't care who won the national championship. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't waste your conversation on any of that, would you? You would say the absolute bottom line essential thing you want them to remember from now on. What would you talk about? What did Jesus say to his disciples the very last thing before going away? Lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world, or even when it feels like your world is ending. I will be with you. I have the privilege now of teaching, I teach a little bit at Duke, uh, in the Divinity School, but uh, more at. Uh, High Point University. I don't know if any of you are familiar with High Point, but what a lovely place. If you haven't seen it, you ought to go. It's good academics. It's visually beautiful. It's kind of like a blend of, uh, I don't know, Cornell and Disney World. It's, it's just a wonderful place, but go if you haven't been there. It's a great institution. I, I teach mostly, uh, all undergrads, but mostly uh, freshmen, sophomores in uh, New Testament studies, biblical themes, church history. So I get a lot of 18, 19 year olds and they're just refreshing and energizing. And um, I try to introduce them to some biblical words, a little Hebrew, a little Greek. You know, I teach about Midrash and Perusia and Hamartia and things. And I always tell them, when you go home on fall break or Christmas break or spring break, I want you to just casually drop one of those words in a conversation with your parents. <laughs> don't linger. Don't make anything much of it. Just, just naturally kind of throw hamartia out there. And I promise you, when you go to bed that night, your mom and dad are going to say to one another, 
Did you hear that? Junior knows Greek. <laughs> Missy understands theology. I tell you, every dollar of tuition is paying off. <laughs> uh, I try to give my kids a little home court advantage, you know. One of the words I always teach them in every class is the Greek word paraclete. It's a wonderful word. You know the word? Yes, you do. Uh, whether you speak Greek or not, you know the word. Anytime in the New Testament you see the phrase Holy Spirit, you're looking at paraclete. You know what it means? One who walks alongside. Talk about comfort. It doesn't mean one who waves a magic wand and makes all your pains go away, but it means whatever you were facing this morning, you were not facing it alone. Whatever road you are walking, you are not walking it alone. Whatever burden you're bearing, you're not bearing it alone. Lo, I will be with you always. I will walk alongside you and wrap arms of love around you and hold you up. That little litany of questions I asked a minute ago, if anybody here had ever experienced something and if you raised your hands, some of you would have raised your hands at least once, if not more. Some of you in your own life or the life of someone you love, that's the weight you are bringing here this morning and maybe it's hidden from everybody except God and you, but you know what's bearing down on you. I simply want you to know that the Palm Sunday message is Jesus rode into the pain of those people to be with those people, to walk alongside them and he will walk alongside you. You're not alone. What does Palm Sunday say to us? When we shout Hosanna, save me now. I don't know if I can cope much longer. What does Palm Sunday say? Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus will go through it with you. You will get through. It may not seem like it at the moment, at any given moment. But when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he knew what was coming. He had already told his disciples about it. They didn't want to hear. They tried to resist. They tried to say, you're wrong. But he had already told them. He knew what was out there. He knew about being betrayed. He knew about being denied. He knew about the illegal series of trials he would face. He knew about the illegal conviction. He knew about the crucifixion. He knew what he was facing and it would be difficult. But he also knew that on the other side of Good Friday, there would be Easter. That God would deliver the deliverer. When I was at Marble Collegiate Church, I succeeded a wonderful dear man named Arthur Caliandro, one of the finest men I ever knew. Arthur is with the Lord now, but his wife Sandy, is, uh, she's a good friend of ours. She and Paige talk all the time and occasionally allow me in on it. <laughs> but what dear, dear people. Arthur used to say, Sometimes the door we want to walk through more than anything else in life is shut in our face and we don't want it and it breaks our heart and we weep, but it is shut in our face. And way down at the other end of a dark corridor, we don't know this, but there's another door and God's going to open it and it'll be just as good and maybe better. But in the meantime, between here and there, he said, it can be hell in the hallway. And some of you have experienced that. And the people in Jerusalem did. And Jesus did. Between the closing of one door and the other yet to come, hell in the hallway, the message of Palm Sunday is, however dark or long that hallway might be, there is Easter. You will get through. 
Norman Vincent Peale used to say it is always just a little bit too early to give up. Let me, let me tell you about an experience I had and with that. With that, I will put this back on and we'll, we'll be done for now. It was seven or eight years ago, uh, a bright, beautiful Sunday in New York, uh, about 80 degrees, the beginning of October, a day very much like yesterday. And we, we spent part of it by your beautiful pools and Paige kept saying, Okay, okay, just lie there in the sun. If you look like a tomato tomorrow, it's not on me. <laughs> uh, but it was a day like that, Sunday afternoon. I'd been invited to preach at this large, beautiful United Methodist Church, a three o'clock Sunday afternoon service up in the middle of Harlem, historic church. And the Methodist churches in Harlem, all of them had been invited to gather at this place. They had a, a unified choir, a huge choir. It was wonderful. sounded almost as good as you. Uh, liturgy and other ministers doing things. And I, they, they asked me to preach uh, for one of two reasons. I really don't know. The first might be because I'm really affordable. Uh, <laughs> Or it may have been, and at least this is what they said, that I was the pastor of what was known as America's Church of Positive Thinking. Uh, Peel wrote The Power of Positive Thinking when he was at Marble. And they wanted a message of hope, a message of encouragement, positivity. And they asked me, can you come and do that for us on this big Sunday afternoon gathering? And I said, I am so honored to be invited. And went. It was a great service. I did the best I knew how to preach about hope and the positive power of Jesus to shed light in our darkness. But I wasn't feeling it. And the reason I wasn't feeling it was that one of our children, we have four children and two grandchildren, and one of them was going through a crisis, which to me seemed like a significant crisis. And you know how we parents are. You want to fix things for your children. They don't always want you to, but you want to. And I was feeling guilty that I wasn't in North Carolina. I was 500 miles away. I was feeling guilty that I wasn't there hands-on to do something for my child. I was feeling a, a part. I was feeling like a poor parent. I was feeling lonely, like a failure. I preached the best I knew how following the service. I remember I was standing on a, on a street corner in, in Harlem, Beautiful day, right across from a big park. I was waiting for the light to change so I could go to the subway and go home. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people out on that lovely Sunday afternoon, uh, older folks on, on benches, uh, older folks meaning, you know, like Bob and me, uh, <laughs> on benches in the park feeding the pigeons, uh, people throwing frisbees, uh, uh, people walking their dogs, uh, kids playing, families with quilts out for picnics, just, and walkers everywhere, everywhere. Beautiful, glorious, joy-filled Sunday afternoon. And there's this guy who had just preached about hope and, and the positive power of Jesus. And I'm standing on a street corner with the weight of the world bearing down on my shoulders. A young man, somewhere between, I guess, 18 and 25, maybe, was on a skateboard. And he weaved his way through that crowd, all those people, and came up and stopped in front of me. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people he could choose. Me? Don't know. Stopped in front of me picked up his skateboard, stepped forward into my space on that corner, looked into my eyes, and he said, quote, everything's going to be fine. It really is. You just need to believe that. And he put down the skateboard and disappeared into the crowd. <sighs> Who was he? Why did he choose me? 
Was he some sort of um, schizophrenic who was saying bizarre things to random people? Was he a psychology student at NYU or Cornell who had been assigned the task of sharing a message with random folks and seeing how they responded? Was he a keen observer of humans? And in that sea of smiling faces, had he seen one face without a smile and decided to share a word of hope with that person? Was he an angel? That's what I thought, especially in the biblical sense, because biblically the word angel means God's messenger. So it doesn't have to have a halo and wings. If your mama or daddy or grandparents or neighbor or friend or classmate or teacher or preacher or coach or a young man on a skateboard says something you need to hear, it's angelic. Who was he? Why did he pick me? All I know is this. When he shared with me a word that across the street I had just shared with hundreds of people, I had spoken that word without hearing it. When he shared with me the word I needed to hear, I felt that weight lifted. Everything's going to be fine. It really is. You just need to believe that. You just need to believe this faith that you've embraced all these years, Reverend. You need to believe this faith that Jesus preached in that big church across the street. You need to believe that God has some power that's bigger than your own. And God loves you. And God knows if you're on Palm Sunday or Good Friday kind of world, He'll get you through. Hosanna. Save us now. Deliver us. We don't think we can deal with it much longer. The Palm Sunday story tells us three things. Jesus knows what you're going through at this moment in your life, in your relationships, in your struggles. Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus will go through it with you every day every moment every step he will walk alongside you and you will get through Easter will come so let me say something to you and if you didn't listen to anything else I said today Take this home with you, okay? Everything's going to be fine. It really is. You just need to believe that.